start recording now. Great. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on this Tuesday afternoon. Uh, it's 5 p.m. here in Sweden. I'm calling from the north of Sweden. There's lots of snow falling outside. Um, so it's proper winter, proper dark now. So for us, uh, we are see some familiar faces, but for those that uh, join us for the first time, so thank you. Uh, my name is Ana Paula Picasso. I'm the founder of Blockchain PR. I also have a podcast called Blockchain Beat. And I'm also the board member of SCBA and community manager. So I'm here today with Sukesh and our special speakers, Brian and Emma. Sukesh is going to introduce them a little bit better after, but um, I will explain how the webinar will work. It's a little bit different today. We are try a different format. So it's going to be very interactive. We start with a fireside ch chat between Brian and Emma. So it's not going to be just one person talking, it'll be lots, like three people talking. Um, and then at the end, we le left a lot of time for you guys to ask questions. So, but please don't speak, leave your microphones muted just write in the chat and then we read out to, to our speakers and they can, they can answer it. And also if you have any technical problems, you, if you can hear the sound or any other questions, please also reach out to me on the chat. I'll be managing the chat. So without further ado, I'm gonna call in Sukesh, Sukesh Tedla also a board member of SBA and uh, that's going to talk a little bit about SBA and also introduce our guest speakers for today. Great. Uh, thanks, Anna. And uh, my name is Sukesh. I'm the uh, board member and the chairman for Swedish Blockchain Association today. Uh, so Swedish Blockchain Association is a non-profit organization. Uh, what we do at Swedish Blockchain Association is like we organize events. Uh, we started back in 2018. Uh, we did a couple of big events like Blockspo, for instance, and then we, we have been organizing uh, local meetups and events. And since uh, Corona hit, uh, we have been doing virtual events uh, during this year. Uh, so each and every month we have some kind of theme uh, where we bring in different guest speakers and try to uh, talk about different technologies and different things that are happening in the blockchain space. And today, uh, uh, we have, uh, we are going to talk about the enterprise blockchains and we have uh, two cool representatives from different organizations uh, where we're going to discuss uh, much more in detail and this format, I'm really looking forward to this format because to this time we, I, I got the opportunity to ask more questions and we can have a discussion rather than uh, last time where we just have a presentation. Uh, so without any further ado, let's get started. And I would like to introduce Brian uh, De Souza, and he is representing uh, Corda Blockchain, uh, R3 Corda Blockchain. And we have Emma, uh, a blockchain uh, and innovation consultant. Um, I really forgot the name of your company. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, okay, but I will let them introduce themselves uh, in just in a bit. Um, so we will have this fireside chat today. So we will have a bunch of questions uh, from myself, uh, from the audience, and we will have the uh, guest speakers discuss and share their views and what they're doing in their organizations as well. So let's get started. So let's start with Brian, maybe. Uh, maybe Brian, you want to introduce yourself uh, just a bit and yourself and maybe about your organization. Uh, we can't hear you, Brian. Oh, uh, so, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I had to double mute. Sorry, apologies about yeah. that. So, hi, um, uh, thank you for having me on um, to on your kind of uh, your session today, and it's really uh, appreciative from myself and R three to have this occasion to uh, to talk about enterprise blockchain. So, a bit about myself, Brian De Souza. I started at R three back in, over a year ago, uh, and my role, uh, being at, based at R three, a software enterprise company now is working with strategic alliances. 
Um, so that's kind of where I started um, and kind of what my role is. Um, I'm based in London and a bit about R3. So those of you unfamiliar with R3, R3 started back in 2015 as a banking consortium. So that was with the leading investment banks around the table. Uh, so like JP Morgan, Citi, all the big banks, US banks and uh, conglomerates that you could, uh, banks that you can think of. Uh, it, it rose up to 42 banks um, and that consortium was in investigating and researching that the use of blockchain and the impact it would have on the financial services. Uh, and then what we realized is that we had these Bitcoin uh, platforms, which was very good for public blockchain and Ethereum. But what we realized um, that there was specific requirements coming from the banks specifically about how we could bring this forward. So we created a platform called Corda uh, and Corda is effectively our uh, core blockchain platform, which we um, offer to enterprises. So that's a bit about myself uh, and R3. Okay, let's go with Emma uh, now. Uh, you're muted, Emma. I was also muted. <laughs> <laughs> to learn. Um, hi, guys. My name is Emma, and I'm a blockchain consultant at Everest UK in their blockchain for banking practice. Uh, I have a background in strategy and joint product management and marketing for the fintech and prop tech space, and I've been working now with Everest mm -hmm. as a blockchain business specialist. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Everest UK is part yes. of... Um, NTT Data, which is a multinational consulting yeah, firm focused yeah, mostly in technology and business strategic solutions. Um, and the blockchain banking practice specifically, we specialize in producing DLT based solutions for financial services and banking clients. Um, since launching in 2015, the practice has developed reference technology frameworks around the Interledger protocol. We've tested and deployed a variety of proof of concepts and have explored uh, numerous use cases for all sorts of different industry segments resulting in securing a variety of different technology partners, which I'm happy to say include our three. So it'll be a great conversation today with Brian, as well as the creation of some internal assets that I hope we'll be able to uh, discuss later today. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. So let's continue with Emma. Uh, so maybe uh, before getting further into the discussion, maybe you want to share uh, what is your opinion on blockchain technology? Like what, what does it mean for you? Like, and why do you think so? Uh, that this is super cool or this is super bad or whatever you feel about it. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm definitely a believer, like probably most of you are. Um, <laughs> you know, I've heard I've heard so many different definitions of blockchain and since it's first started in its infancy, we've really seen where it can go. But I think the most impactful way I've ever heard blockchain described was just simply being described as a new network. Because at the end of the day, much like the internet, you know, once was a new technology, DLT and blockchain technologies really allow us to transfer data from one party to another at its most granular. And when I kind of heard it put in those terms, it was super, it just resonated with me and I got so interested in learning more. And so, you know, as we know, it doesn't necessarily have to be just transactional data, but it can be hash information, documents, tokenized identity, or really any asset. That is most granular, one peer is transferring something to the other. And I think that kind of goes into the big differentiator that we have here, which is that it's not just any network, but it's built with transparency and trust at its core. So as you guys know, there's no intermediaries, there's no centralized management or manager, there's just generally no intermediation. And because of that, there's only one shared truth. So in my view, it's this idea of a peer-to-peer -peer network really manifesting so I'm definitely a believer, and that's kind of, I guess, my personal definition of how I would um, describe blockchain just in general, outside of terms of enterprise or enterprise. Cool. Uh, when did you first get into the blockchain space, actually? Like, when did you first hear the word blockchain? Yeah, so I was uh, actually in university. I was taking a course called Economics for Extractive Industries, and Basically, we had to do some sort of research report. I was already in the technology space, and I was like, "What am I gonna ever come out with?" And I start. I read. Um, I read basically a use case just about the potential applications of blockchain for tracking diamonds across global supply chains from extraction into, you know, the end of it. And I was like, "This is so interesting." And that was the first moment that I got interested. But within that research, it was actually a book that truly made me a believer and was the way I heard it described as uh, simply a network, which was called A Blueprint for a New Economy by Melanie Swan, Melanie Swanson maybe. Um, but that, I, I like can vividly remember that as being like the first the moment of like, oh, okay, this is something real. And then after that, I got involved in the startup space and then eventually increased my knowledge and uh, joined Everest as a blockchain consultant. 
Awesome, awesome. Uh, let's hear from Brian, like uh, what brought you to the blockchain space or uh, when did you first hear about the blockchain and what does it mean for you? Uh, so, and you're also working from an enterprise now with our three core devs, yeah. like you might have a different perspective. Yeah, similar to Emma, I guess I started at, when I was at Society General, my last employee, um, a French investment bank, uh, part of the working group. For, so I, I was lucky and fortunate enough to be involved uh, very early on from 2016 onwards. Um, where I saw the value of um, kind of, I heard the word blockchain and I went and researched it and I found out Bitcoin and the value of Bitcoin and Ethereum and so on. And I realized, oh, this is, this is okay. There's, there's something great here on the public blockchain side of things. So I sort of realized, okay, let me do some investigation. Um, and there was a lot of uh, the value of um, Bit, uh, Bitcoin was going up, um, which is great. And then I realized, okay, so what's the underlying technology to that? And what does it really entail? Uh, and how can it be used by enterprises and society general, for example? And then I realized, uh, who are the main players trying to bring that about? And then R3 kind of came into the picture quite early on. Um, and there was other players like IBM and Consensus, as you're probably familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, but what that really meant to me was going in and digging in a bit deeper about what problems can it solve? Um, mm -hmm. Not looking for a problem, but what, 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 what is it good at? And that was where I really realized, okay, there's this something, this technology that can really, it's, a, it's working multiple parties in an ecosystem that can help them effectively exchange uh, in a safe and secure way. Um, and, and it's really the business value that can, can come out the back of it. And that was really the kind of early steps of it. And then I think working at a bank, privacy and security are kind of fundamental to whatever you do. Um, and that was the kind of mindset in my thinking, is this safe and secure and would a bank use it? Uh, the answer for Bitcoin uh, and kind of Ethereum was kind of potentially, but it still needed to be improved. Uh, and being at R three, we were our objective was to create a platform that would solve for those problems um, to ensure that banks could use it in a highly regulated environment. Okay, uh, that sounds great. Let's dig into a bit more uh, when it comes to that uh, banking part and the uh, private blockchain or the private industry, right? So, uh, but let's first hear from uh, Emma, like from a consulting and innovation perspective. Uh, how do you see, like, what kind of uh, organizations are coming uh, to your company and requesting blockchain expertise or like uh, what kind of solutions uh, in general or what are the industries that you're seeing uh, often? Definitely. So, I mean, I think, you know, if we look at the last little bit in terms of the consulting space, like with many new technologies, the adoption has been, you know, a little bit slow, but cyclical yeah. in a way, in the sense that when a new technology emerges, in the somewhat mainstream narrative, there's so much hype around it. So now we will have all sorts of different corporations, whether that's in finance, which is where um, the practice that I'm involved with specifically services or across all sorts of different industries, as well as startups, investors, and even some consumers who might wanna you know, jump on that bandwagon and be the catalyst and the early adopters. But when that happens so early, oftentimes there's, you know, or implementation or maybe not enough information to actually implement it properly. And it just leads to a lot of, um, a lot of projects that won't necessarily deliver the benefits either because it just wasn't the right use case. Maybe they didn't have the proper expertise or in some cases, it's just a matter of the technology just not having been matured enough yet, right? We didn't know some of the problems that we would actually see in implementation. So it will lead to subpar results, low adoption and that hype kind of fizzles out. So, you know, that's, I feel like from 2016 to 2018, even a little bit of 19, that was kind of what was happening in the space. And so when that adoption fizzles out, of course, all the different ecosystem stakeholders then grow weary of implementing these technologies. But we're kind of past that cycle now. And what we're seeing coming out of that today is a lot more real substantial use cases coming to us where blockchains are actually the right solutions for operational challenges. So it's no longer people just, you know, wanting to have the ability to promote that they're utilizing blockchain either across their organization and enterprise or for startups, maybe to investors. But now we're starting to see it used more as the actual back end technology in, in the way that it was supposed to be, essentially. Yeah. What's happening is that there's industry building around that. So this might include things like working groups. It might include service providers, you know, similar to R3 uh, and, and other enterprise service providers, and then um, professional services firms like Everest starting to have a subsection of their operations 
looking specifically for blockchain. So with that, now these consulting professional services firms really have the ability to kind of leverage that relationship with service providers and increase the number of applicable use cases that are going from, that are passing the proof of concept stage, right? Because now when we have great uh, technical partners, we can go from proof of concept to production one with their support quite a bit faster and for these massive, massive applications. So now what we're starting to see is to move past that initial hype and past the initial blow and really start to get a little bit more um, adoption across bigger use cases and to, to real deployment. So what I see, and, and of course this is specifically in finance, but I think it goes across a variety of industries because we're really getting that maturity and developing the ecosystem around it. And I think that it's safe to say we're only gonna see further partnerships. We're only gonna see the ecosystem and service providers engaging more and even possibly getting involved with academia and government to continue to develop over the next few years and understand um, the true uses and more adoption at the network layer. So I really think that we'll see a lot more partnerships with service providers and uh, okay, so when you mentioned the finance industry, right, specifically, like, are we talking now about the payments part or digital payments or digital assets or like, uh, no, is so there any specific subdomain that you really see uh, that of interest? in? The yeah, so I think that there's kind of two characteristics. And one is essentially any area in finance where there's a reduction in time and cost required. So that might be things, like you said, like payments with clearing and settlement, but this is also within banks with contract dispute and non-repudiation, right? Or even in um, KYC and AML among correspondent banking relationships. Oh, yeah. So basically anywhere where you can have, you need that reduction in time and cost, but also where there's an administrative burden with large, you know, large, network of stakeholders mm -hmm. and participants, uh, much correspondence, a lot of coordination, communication, and touch points. So of course payments is like everybody's kind of first <laughs> yeah. initial reaction when they think blockchain and finance, but I don't want to overlook the importance of operations and admin. So it's actually been also internally within banks as well as payments, um, trade finance, KYC and AML, uh, and even regulatory reporting and audit is becoming more and more relevant with all sorts of different European and um, UK based regulation for ESG, for example, right, where we know mm. that there's going to have to be more audits um, monitoring specific KPIs that yeah. come from a variety of different stakeholders, we're going to start to see more just the, how powerful blockchain is internally. So that's a lot what we're seeing, as well as uh, the sustainability subjects, sustainability and banking. And how blockchain can leverage them. That, that's really great. Like uh, I personally uh, have been involved a bit more in the recent days, like with the mobility sector, for instance, like I have yeah. been seeing a lot of trends right now and also getting requests uh, from the local companies here in Sweden uh, as it's a mobility industry here, uh, especially with the Volvo cars and SIFT and all the organizations. Mm -hmm. They started working on these new data economies with blockchain and trust. And uh, they are trying to reach out and ask like, okay, how can we do something about this? Or how, uh, how, what kind of solution would it look like? Uh, and so forth. Yeah, I see uh, trends across like, uh, and requests across different industries, like finance is the first thing, but now we are seeing much wider uh, adoption. Do you want to add something on to that? Uh, Brian or Emma, do you want to add something on top of that? Uh, probably. One of the things I would say is that we've, uh, Emma touched on this, we've done uh, with certainly R3, we've seen lots of yeah. our members doing POCs um, yeah. and that was kind of 2016 to 2018 and kind of yeah. 19. And I think 20 has been the year of deployment. Uh, I call it the year of deployment. So our CTO, Richard Gendel Brown talks about um, the being in the trenches of deployment. So what we've seen is that people understanding how to take something from a conceptual idea and prove the business viability uh, and put the groundwork of governance operations, the key things that getting the right consortium members around the table uh, and ensuring that there's a common interest and everyone's gaining from that. So I think this is the important thing about blockchain. It has a network effect. And typically in consortiums, you tend to see, if I take B3I, which is a reinsurance consortium, it's bringing all those members together, like the Swiss Re's, Generales, Allianz's, yeah. big players to come around the table and say, okay, 
we all want to come together to achieve the same goal and we're all going to benefit it from it in some value. Um, but how can we accelerate that? So governance is a key aspect of that and building that kind of from the start is underestimated, I typically see. Uh, and, and people and compliance, obviously, as well. And, and how do we operationalize that? That's a key aspect of it. And I think people are starting to understand that this frameworks that typically um, Everest and other consultancy partners put together can accelerate that time to market quicker because they've done this before. They can understand how to bring these members together, how to work together. And a key word of that bringing out is cooptition, I think, really important cooptition. And that's what ecosystems really happening now is whether it brings industries, at, especially at Corda, what we're doing in the Italian banking uh uh, Splinter project in Italy, reconciliation project is mm -hmm. effectively bringing all 100 banks within Italy, the banking system, mm -hmm. um, all together to cooperate and share that information uh, to solve a problem, which is regulatory requirement, right? So this is like at a large scale. And going back to the point of where this technology is, it's really at um, maturity point. It's scaled to 204 million transactions. It can do up to 8 billion transactions a year. So this is, gives you a kind of understanding that this is something that's mature, resilient, uh, mm -hmm. and really enterprise grade. When we talk about enterprise grade, it's can it be deployed in the bank, mm -hmm. on premise or in the cloud? Mm -hmm. And how do we accelerate that time to market? And now is the time that we're seeing that. And we've seen the likes of NASDAQ in uh, working in Sweden, yeah. big players backing uh, Corda, having done lots of POCs in the past and really looking at it to create digital asset exchanges. So that's mm -hmm. kind of indicated where we're going here with the market infrastructure players. So um yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's real when it's happening and 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 it's accelerating very quickly yeah i really agree on the cooperation point because like this is the same thing that i see right now with the mobility sector as well like there is this consortium called mobi uh it's so interesting to see that new oem companies or the car manufacturers or the software developers they want to join this consortium now and to establish that standard for data sharing practices or like uh, benefiting uh uh, together uh, rather than just competing with each other in this space. So I definitely see that um, change of mindset uh, across organizations. Uh, let's move on. So uh, let's talk about like maybe, uh, of course, like there are different types of blockchains out there. Uh, maybe you can um, uh, give us a bit of uh, understanding uh, what exactly blockchain, uh, the way you can classify different blockchains. And how do you do that? Like you have private, you have public, you have hybrid blockchain. So uh, how do you classify? Uh, maybe you can go uh, first, Brian. So good question. So I guess the way I classify it, there's two, uh, taking a step back, there's two types of blockchains, right? There's permission versus private. Mm -hmm. uh, and typically when I think of permissioned, I think of this, I would say, I'm not going to be biased, but I would say there's three players, obviously R3, Corda, leading the pack. And then you have IBM, Hyperledger, Fabric. And then you have Quorum, which is kind of um, under consensus, kind of on the fringes, right? So, um, and the way to think of, the, and then on the, the public side of things, you have Bitcoin, Ethereum, and there's some other, there's lots of other platforms out there, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the two that people kind of relate to and kind of distinguish the two between the two. Um, so I, I, I'm probably well positioned to talk about because I know that um, Bitcoin and um, Ethereum have lots of value. Um, and I, I know I, I, I back it myself on the side um, as a separate, if depending on the use cases and what you're doing. But for a permissions uh, focused use case and what enterprises are looking for is security. Um, I, I talk about Corda, the three principles of Corda, why it was born. And that will probably give you indication of what, what we're seeing and other similar blockchains, right? So we see security as a fundamental. So when we go into any enterprise, they talk about what, what is it that you can, uh, what is it, uh, can you provide? Is it safe and secure? Um, is security, that, what's your consensus model? What's, how does that work? And we work on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. So that's sharing information. We're not actually a blockchain same, same, in same. essence. We're more of a distributed ledger technology. So we're a point to point basis, uh, sharing information on a need to know basis, mm -hmm. um, which is really important when you're working with financial services or on a bilateral com um, contacts, uh, context rather. And then what we see another one is, is this um, privacy. So I talked about privacy here, security and privacy come hand in hand. Typically when you're working, can you make sure my data is secure and not not everyone can see my data because effectively what I'm sharing on this on the ledger I don't want everyone every participant in the ecosystem so if I'm JP Morgan for example mm -hmm. and I'm SEB are there 
uh, and I'll put uh, Danske Bank. I wouldn't want um, Danske Bank to see the transaction, business transaction I'm doing with SEB, right? It's yeah. just common practice. So that's a key requirement. And the third one is, um, I think it go, goes missing. Can we scale this? So typically on a public blockchain, mm -hmm. you're, you're sharing a message with everyone and that doesn't need to be the case in enterprise use. So, right, it's only on a need to know basis where I'm sharing that fact, it gets shared with someone. And that's the key kind of fundamentals of Corda, I would say. And we've seen great uptake from that with, um, I can talk about a telecommunication company in the Nordics, a major one you'll be familiar with, um, that is leveraging Corda for that reason. They've moved to us. We see a lot of people moving from Hyperledger uh, Fabric because what by design Corda is taking into consideration privacy and security and can we scale this and that's really the fundamentals of what we're doing right and we started in the financial services but doesn't mean we're restricted to financial services um it can be used uh, across because i see ecosystem plays really expanding from financial services from a b2b aspect so mm -hmm. can the bank's clients which are huge conglomerates like the likes of volvo and uh, ikea and all these other companies you're familiar with in the, uh, sweden how can they benefit from that? And I think that's where blockchain can really enable that um, B2B transactions and sharing data in a safe and secure way. And I think Emma touched upon this with assets. We yeah. think of assets as typically, it could be trace and track, a track and trace rather. It could be um, a, an asset that goes for a life cycle. And how can it be tracked effectively to know that, that that's the orig original origin of that asset um, that's that's genuine um, and can be deliver value at the right timing through the kind of value chain, as we call it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of a key aspect. I think those are the kind of two, um, and I can talk more about Corda, but um, happy yeah, to- Yeah, I think we're thoughts. gonna get into that in a bit, uh, uh, bit of time. Um, so you mentioned about, like you shared about different different point of views on the public and the private blockchain. I, I personally get this question a lot whenever I speak with organizations and companies. Okay, which blockchain should we choose? Should we go with the Hyperledger uh, because we are a company? Should we choose the private blockchains for that reason? Or like, uh, should we choose a public blockchain? So what exactly uh, do, you, do you need, right? So that's the obvious question I keep getting many and many times. Uh, so uh, maybe Emma, do you wanna add something on top of this? Yeah, well, not so much about looking at the, you know, what's required when you, developing out a solution, but I just thought it was really interesting how in the last two questions that we both brought up this idea of being able to have this intercommunication between the banks and financial services, as well as their clients. So whether that's the Ikea or Volvo or mm -hmm. us, as we were talking about mobility, right? And being able to have all of this um, intercommunication. And I think that brings up a point, especially within the regulatory frameworks of how how we can see this view for the ecosystem of being able to actually take this track and trace data and provide it to you know due diligence or company head offices to create a report and then provide all of this verified data to actually provide to the financial services or the investors of mm -hmm. these companies or the you know service providers of these companies. And I, it's a little bit off topic, but I just think it, it's interesting that it came up in both places because I think that's how we can see this ecosystem of the private blockchains going, but that will require, of course, you know, interledger communication, which I'm sure we'll get into thereafter. But I just wanted to point it out that it came up in both points because it, it's a really important point for anybody who's looking at what the future of enterprise blockchain is going to look like. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree on that. And uh, uh, let's let's uh, dig in a bit more about the enterprise blockchain, right? Like uh, Brian touched a bit about, okay, what exactly is an enterprise blockchain? Uh, so I want to understand, uh, or maybe for the audience as well, like what are the essential requirements? Like you mentioned, uh, privacy and security, uh, right, Brian? So from your point of view and interactions and even yourself, Emma, with the corporations and banking systems and different companies, what are they looking for? Uh, and why are they interested in like enterprise blockchains uh, specifically? Is it only the privacy and security aspects or is it the scalability? Like, what's the one thing that that's uh, making their decision to choose uh, private or public? Well, I think that so Brian said it well, right? Security, privacy, and scalability. I think is the questions, the three things that come up in any conversation when you're talking about implementing a blockchain-based solution for an enterprise. 
But I would say the most important thing, right, is that when enterprises are interested in um, a DLT or a blockchain-based solution, they'll essentially come to you wanting to get all of the benefits and the cost reduction, the mutability and the streamlinability or automation of blockchain and DLT without actually having to fully open up their operations, their, their operations, their internal um, their internal transactions, you know, the different participations and deals, or even just the findings, records, or data that are then going to be posted to the ledger, right, or stored within the DLT network. So at the end of the day, they want to make sure that they have control, and that control kind of leads into the security, the security, the privacy, and the scalability, because it's a matter of making sure they have control over the infrastructure enough to know that it adheres with all of their internal regulations, um, and their compliance requirements, right? And then also having control over the consensus mechanisms, because we need to remember that, you know, an investment bank who might be looking at a certain, I don't know, trade finance use case versus a, um, a versus a retail bank who's looking to implement a DLT-based solution to streamline contract, uh, you know, negotiation and non-repudiation, they might have a very different way of achieving consensus or deciding what that single source of truth is. And so you need to understand all of the different requirements when you're looking at a solution. So I go back to the one thing being that they want to have a level of control over it and making sure in turn that it is secure, private, and you know, relatively scalable, depending on how many participants are there. But I think even the scalability question brings us to another um, key difference, right, between public and private, which is that, you know, private blockchain tends to just be so much more efficient, right? Mm -hmm. They're literally more energy efficient and less power consumption, but you mm -hmm. also have more control over the participants. It's less participants, right? It's not inherently developed for however many millions of people want to trade, uh, trade the <laughs> asset like this point is, yeah. but it's everything is on demand. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that just, it's important to have that level of control and that's why more, sorry, important to have that level of control, but also while retaining all of the benefits that traditional blockchains or DLT can bring. Mm -hmm. And so that's why organizations tend to go with, um, with private. And there are certain use cases where you might use both, right? independently. So it's not necessarily going to be a hybridized solution, but where you are doing where I was mentioning the, you know, from track and trace into reporting and then handing that over to investors um, who might need to disclose their ESG KPIs, right, or an ESG report, which as you guys might or might not know will be coming into play in 2021 as mandatory law in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they might want to certify and move that data across stakeholders on a private blockchain or on multiple private blockchains with uh, with intercommunication, but then be able to publish that report on public blockchain, right? And allow just the general public to download and decrypt the report and knowing that it's certified and that it's actually what was produced. So there are use cases where you can see both, but generally um, I would say it's about control and flexibility, which inherently need privacy, scalability, and security. Yeah, I think uh, you mentioned really well. Um, and I think um, uh, Anna, Anna, as our community manager, she speaks with a lot of uh, people on the social media and channels. Um, she she has some questions. Uh, I want to bring in Anna to uh, ask her questions. Anna, you want to? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. So I'm a non-tech person, so I always <laughs> trying to find out the differences. So it's a two, it's a basically a two-part question, right? So what are the key differences between a private and a public blockchain? Because I think people are more familiar, uh, or at least I'm more familiar with pu the public blockchains. And also how should an enterprise choose uh, which one, if they go for a private blockchain or just use a public one? Do you want to go first, Emma? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, but uh, <laughs> but it is really in terms, right? We have better scalability and more efficiency. And this is scalability and efficiency, not only in participation, but it also in consensus. 
because you're not necessarily relying on proof of work or proof of stake, but in systems like Porta, where it might be designed with notary nodes or even, you know, Hyperledger, we discussed where it has more and more plausible consensus, there's just a level of efficiency over being able to decide what that mechanism consensus looks like, consensus, sorry, looks like, rather than having to go through proof of work or proof of stake, which tends to be very, um, you know, very cost efficient and consumes a lot of power uh, because there tends to be so many different participants. Um, and then at the same time, it's the control, which is again, what I mentioned a minute ago, but to kind of reiterate it in maybe a more digestible fashion, when your enterprise needs to be able to control the resources, right, that are there. So who do we actually want on it? How many nodes do we need? How many channels may we need? And how many people um, can have read or write permission? And who are those people, right? They need to be able to control that access because as Brian said, you don't want your competitors to be able to see, you know, what transactions you're doing and with whom. Uh, and then on the other side of it, there's just a level of control over the infrastructure. Right? The more control that the enterprise might hold over the infrastructure, the more that they can ensure one interoperability with their existing legacy systems, which in the financial services space, I mean, you know, the bank's core banking services are, have been the same for quite a long time. <laughs> so you need to make sure that these new technologies can be, you know, can work, right, with those systems. And at the same time, it comes back to compliance, right? You don't just have external regulation, but there's internal compliance standards that you need to be able to meet. And by using, let's say, a public blockchain, you can't really have that level of flexibility or that level of control. So it's a lot harder to develop them into a solution that adheres with all of these different requirements. Whereas when you take a private DLT, you essentially have that flexibility to, um, to mold it in the way that you need for your organization. So Ultimately, those, those I would say are the key differences, but ultimately, you know, how do we decide who needs what? Yeah. Well, it just depends on the business's requirements at the end of the day. If they're doing something that they, maybe it's something with corporate social responsibility where they want to showcase what they're doing, there's an opportunity to use a public blockchain there. Mm -hmm. Generally, because of the nature of wanting to operate on a need to know basis and requiring a level of privacy and security, um, it, we do tend to implement a lot more, you know, enterprise and private blockchain. But at the end of the day, we're going to ask ourselves questions like, who needs this information? Does it hurt anybody if the general public has asked access to it? Um, what are the compliance requirements? How is truth achieved? And sometimes even, do you actually need a shared store and consistent yeah. data, right? Is this really required for what you need? So these are the kinds of questions we might start asking before making those decisions of, uh, you know, private or public blockchain. Brian, I'm not sure if you have anything to add. <laughs> I think you touched on a really important point. When now, uh, the, the way to look at it is um, blockchain shouldn't sit alone as a single siloed system because it has no value uh, just being a single siloed system. So when we talk to the likes of MasterCard and all these large companies, effectively, which is in public domain, they, they talk about how can it integrate with our existing systems? So how can we integrate into our ERP systems? How does it make it more effective and efficient for me to building on something that can uh, effectively connect into our existing stacks, right? Mm -hmm. And typically, and do I have to learn a new language? Do my developers have to learn Solidity or do I have to invest more money to that? Or is it using Java or JVM or Kotlin that it's a bit more... It's, it's a like if you look at the Java community, there's 12 million developers, right? And the skills are there. Um, so investing in that as well. So if we look at it from different angles about how you take that from a um, enterprise grade, is it is it been used in enterprises for years? Yes, Java has. So what's the risk? So companies always think about remediating risks, right? I think think like a, a bank or a, uh, a company is like, how do we make sure our investment uh, we're investing in this technology how can we reduce our mitigate our risks and we've been able to do that by guiding them and providing that support uh, very early on to ensuring that their needs uh, for deployment are there because it's all well and good building something but can i deploy it easily can i scale it and those are the questions we're ask, asking ourselves now and we're really able to help our customers do that um, and it's not easy uh, blockchain uh, and dlt and corda but what we do do is we simplify that uh, and we accelerate that. So that's what we're seeing, I think, with consortiums going into the future. I think we're going to see that scalability with cloud providers working with other operators like Microsoft Azure and AWS to make sure we can help deploy that with one click. And I think that's the way forward as well. Great, great. And I just have a quick follow-up question. So 
how are the private blockchains different from a distributed dat database solution? Do you want to carry on, yeah. Brian? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. So interestingly, our CTO done a really good uh, blog post on this, Richard Gendel Brown, about um, distributed databases, how they're different. So I guess the way to look at a distributed database and look at it. So you have a single point in the middle who um, effectively provides um, the, the acts, there's trust boundaries. I think, of, think about it as trust boundaries. So you're in this trust boundary with everyone, all the participants, A, B, and C, and D in this participants ring. And in the middle, you have this kind of central database. Effectively, what that means is that all that information that's been shared between A, B, C, and D parties is effectively just being shared. But the, the problem of blockchain and what we find with um, and talking about distributed ledger technology, the difference is that typically most parties don't trust each other. Um, and in order to build trust, you need a verification process. And that's what Corda has. So ver Corda has a verification on a point to point. You still have to approve that information that you're getting and receiving and acknowledge it. Uh, and that's the verification consensus that we have. So it's on a point to point basis. So if I'm, uh, for example, MasterCard and I'm working with um, a retailer, for example, let's just make it up, Ikea, I have, I'm sending that signal and it's up to them to, to validate it. So there's a validation verification process. So there's these trust boundaries that are in between all these parties, like in between to say, can I send that information, that transaction and, and accept it? And that, and, and then we have like double spending and, and notaries to, to avoid these types of things to make sure each transaction is unique in, in the census and the money hasn't been used before. And there's finality to make sure that that transaction is actually final uh, and cannot be irreversed because it, in, when you're dealing with large sums of money, for example, you, you wouldn't want a transaction to be reversed, right? The risk of reversal. Yeah. So it's irrevocable in that respect. So I think the key distinguished there is building trust between parties, there's a verification process. And that's what distributed ledger offers uh, where parties don't trust each other. Because uh, mm -hmm. databases, everyone's, assuming everyone trusts one another, that works really well then in that case. Okay, Emma, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, just really quickly, um, you know, if I can add, and this is really just building off what Brian said, but it's the idea that, you know, even if a distributed database does have some sort of consensus log logic that was written by an algorithm or that was written into it, um, or tend to be immutable, because sometimes you can have distributed databases that are immutable, um, the biggest difference is the way that it's done, right? It's still centralized because it's written. There's somebody who's actually saying, what's that going to look like? Whereas in general, the control for DLPs tend to be uh, consensus mechanisms that aren't centralized, but mathematically proven by corollary. Oh my God, I always have a hard time with this word. Corollary, <laughs> uh, meaning it's truly decentralized um, rather than necessarily being, you know, written in based on, as Brian said, assuming all the parties trust one another. Okay, great. So guys, our chat room has been really uh, full of questions. <laughs> so um, thank you so far uh, for very interesting uh, explanations. I have a question from Ricard. Hey, Ricard. And he wants a clarification. What do you mean by security in the private blockchain world? What goes into that world? So a little bit clarification what security means. Emma, do you want to take it or do you want me to have it? Um, yeah, uh, well, if you wanted to, why don't you start us off given uh, these are <laughs> kind of yeah. so, values. So I think about security is um, one of the key things when we go into a, a bank, um, can our system be hacked, right? I think cybersecurity is a big part of that. So when I'm deploying it in within my firewall, uh, which we have a quarter firewall as well, which um, allows us to go into the DMZ. I, I won't get technical, but effectively, when we're building something, please get technical if you can. <laughs> uh, I'm not Whatever very technical. I, I'm not very technical, but I, I'm more on the business side partnerships. But I can happily, if you have a question, we can uh, get our CTO involved or someone in our product team who can answer it in a much better way than I can. But I think the key. Sure, yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, I can pass the key. The things, yeah. yeah, the key uh, point I would make across here is that. When we go into the, I, um, let's just take SEB, for example, uh, in Sweden, they, the key questions they ask us is how resilient and secure is your module? Um, and, and that means, can this be um, 
effectively can someone hack in and take this data and effectively manipulate it and how do we mitigate those risks with our cryptography methods that we're using right um, and because the way we design Corda, and I won't get, I, I'm not very technical to be honest, but I, I think we should take this as a separate question because I think it's a very good question uh, and, and our, our technical team will be a really best position to answer this. But the, the key thing is, can we meet the security requirements when we go into these corporates of, um, I guess these are key comply, key security questions. So we have uh, info risk, right? So when you go into a bank, they ask you the questions like, uh, what type of, uh, I guess, what type of, uh, protocols are you using uh, what, what's the kind of uh, vulnerabilities I think you would say and being able to tick those boxes which we have done and I don't know what exactly what they are a to z but I think gives you a level of comfort and just to give you an example we've recently signed a um, agreement with uh, the DTCC that which they announced at our annual event Cordicon which gave gives you a quick clear indication they are very uh, adverse to risk uh, when it comes to security. They're dealing with a US equity market. I don't know if you're familiar with how many trades go for a US equity market, but security was the key fundamentals for them. And being able to adhere to that, this is proven, right? This is not just me saying it. Um, and it's being able to tick the boxes for their compliance officers. And these guys, even Citibank and Wells Fargo and all these US banks, they have the highest uh, criteria for security. So I think just gives you a reassurance in your head that we're obviously doing something right uh, and we're on the right path to adhering to the questions they have because anyone that when you go to these corporations the first thing I think about is security how do I mitigate my risks can we go for the risk registry with the with the procurement team because if you don't go through that stage you're not going any further through the conversations and we've been able to do that which is hard work and testament to our product and um, our team um, for putting the right um, kind of I guess structure to governance around that because it's all about governance as well how do we deal with mitigate those risks when they do come up um probably didn't answer your question because you wanted a technical one but um i think we can take that offline so yeah definitely regards. i can uh give your details to ricard and you guys can catch up uh outside that so yeah so i want to move to challenges of adoption we had a very uh discussion here between uh, Jesper and Patrick. Uh, Jesper started with, uh, let me just find it here, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yes, he is a product designer, uh, UX, product and UX designer, and he feels quite frustrated seeing poor UX. So what's your opinion on this? What especially considering we need mass adoption? So uh, thinking about customer centricity, so what's your opinion? Brian, Emma, do you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, well, I think that, you know, we don't necessarily, when you're looking at enterprise blockchain, that's not necessarily going to be on the consumer layer, right? Like our consumer layer, our application layer is going to be whatever consumer application that you want to build and that you want to design. But the real value of bringing in uh, enterprise enterprise blockchain is more in the network layer, right? And the protocol layer. So it's not necessarily going to be, you know, consumer facing more as it's going to be implemented in the use cases or in the potential products where the benefits that blockchain, that private blockchains bring are actually seen and manifested in the back end. Um, now I understand if you're talking about, you know, in product design meetings where it's hard to convince people that this might be what's needed. And I think that brings us to a really big, uh, a really big challenge, which is we really need a shift in paradigm to understand exactly this, that it goes past the idea of this current reputation of, you know, Bitcoin and convoluted with public blockchains. And that's kind of only what it can be used for and understand that it actually is what's going to be used at different layers of the technology to create a more efficient, lighter process and manage that information. But I think in terms of like UI UX, it's kind of a matter of like, keep doing what you're doing and doing behavioral customer centric design and allow blockchain to be kind of like the back end system in those use cases that require that type of uh, that require that type of network or, or protocol, depending on what you're building. Great. So, yes, it's interesting you, you said about shifting paradigm and 
vampire dying. I can never say that word. <laughs> <laughs> and so actually, Patrick, he, he made a very good point in the chat saying user centricity is important and the way the paradigm shifts when using blockchains for enterprise. So yeah. And I think I have a question for you, Brian, from Ricard <laughs> <laughs> about R3. Uh, let me just find it here. What roles do smart contra contracts play in R3? Are they useful? Are they being are they being used? Sorry, um, I seen yeah. So I guess part of that question is they they are being used. And the unique thing about Corda, and I'd probably take a step back and. Um, we have this workflows framework. I, I think it's a powerful tool in automation of um, taking kind of business logic and making sure the flow and the states work together uh, to go end to end on the transaction. So typically you think of smart contracts do this if this happens, but the workflows framework, which I would advise if you haven't got on the quarter.net website to, to, to go onto that website and have a look at the flows framework, because that's effectively an automation uh, tool, tooling, which is beneficial to business process logic, which banks and corporations and it, for any use cases you're looking to develop, the flows framework is very powerful in itself. And that's just not even taking into consideration the actual ledger um, part of it. So I think to answer your question, they are used uh, and they are very useful and powerful. We have seen it with a few use cases, well, lots of use cases actually where the flows framework is very powerful. I did see a question from Patrick, so I won't avoid it, um, but SGX, you touched on Conclave. So this is a very exciting initiative that we're taking to market um, uh, starting in 2021. Um, there is a website I did share with, uh, I think it shared it with um, Anna Paula um, about the yes, conclave.net. Con conclave yep. So if okay. you're interested in this space, please check out conclave.net. This is you. a very exciting space for R3 and a new product that we are excited to take to market up the stack, which is a privacy preserving technology. So a simple use case would be if I am a, uh, a let's just take a um, KYC use case, right? So if I am a KYC, um, if I'm a a bank, for example, when I want to share my KYC information, I typically don't want to share the underlying data uh, because that's very confidential and that's data that is very valuable. But what I can do is I can use that information to benchmark against other people in a black box, which we call Enclave, um, to effectively run those calculations effectively in a safe and secure way. And that's using SGX, which you touched on. So that's what we have a very close partnership with Intel and it's very exciting. So I, I'm excited to um, talk about that. Well, our CTO is doing a lot of work on this and our Mike Hearns, you're probably familiar with, who's probably five years ahead onto the next project that we're working on but and product. But I think it's very interesting. So Mike Hearns is passionate about this. Um, he's very close to Moby, which you touched on, Sukesh. But there's a lot of use case where people don't want to share underlying data. And can we share that in a way that's safe and secure? Yes. And that's Conclave uh, to simply answer the question. So I think just, sorry, expanded off another question I saw. <laughs> well, uh, the problem is we're running out of time. We have roughly <laughs> five minutes. Do, you, do we have more time for another question, Sukesh, or shall we just wrap up and... Yeah, I think we can take one more question. One more question, then, uh, one more yeah. question. Let's see here. <laughs> um, yes, so here I have a question from Magnus from AI, from Norway AI. So let me just find it here, yes. Uh, he says the AI de developed solution Nightfall, which is now also integrating to baseline protocol. What are your thoughts on this? I, are you guys familiar uh, with uh, that solution? Or if not, I, we can take this. I, go ahead, Emma. Oh, yeah. I actually am not familiar with the solution. So I'll okay. a little yeah. bit more information. Brian, I'm not sure about you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I've heard lots about EY talking about this. I haven't seen much of it lift off the ground, to be honest. Um, but <laughs> I'm guessing Magnus might be working for EY or uh, yeah, he's asking the question uh, potentially. So I think yeah. probably worth... Um, I, I, I don't have much to add to it, to be honest, at the moment. Um, I haven't okay. seen much of it, but proof is always in the pudding, as I say, so I, I don't know too much. <laughs> <That's so. laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. I was just uh, wondering if you'd be familiar with that. 
So I think that's it, guys. Um, there's there were there were a lot of questions here. Do you guys, Brian? Do you want to add I had, anything? I had one more point about the UI UX, and I think Emma touched on it, yes, which is really well. Yes, like please do. A, a lot of what I see in the and, and it's a good point because I, typically when you're interfacing with a business user, they don't really care what the underlying technology is. To be honest, I'll be honest. So for us, it's about going in and solving the problem, but making it look kind of shiny and modern. And the UI and experience is very key to that. So I think you touched on a really good point. Um, so that typically I'm talking about business users. So like when I'm a sponsor of a business and yeah. you're pitching to executives, they wanna see that this looks kind of, I can follow it very easily. I get the business value. I get all the requirement. I understand what that can be and it can save me X amount. So for example, I'm doing a stable coin. This saves me $25 per e-message for swift wow okay you got my attention it's a grabber so the next thing is what does the interface look like have, have you built an accelerator have you built an application what does it look like to give them that real touch and feel to the value um because that effectively gets the decision maker sponsoring the project which ultimately then takes the project forward because the technical stuff is always can be fixed it's more about the ui side of things that people struggle be with in the due diligence yeah <laughs> yeah so i think the to that point, I think that the UIs I've seen haven't been great to date, but I've seen some very good ones as well at the same time. And I think this is somewhere where we're seeing SIs and um, ISVs really focus on the user experience and making sure that's really good to tell the story effectively. Um, yeah. And another point, I think what we're seeing as well is other technologies like AI, um, data analytics um, and blockchain as the underlying protocol all converging together to see how can we bring these technologies to play together nicely. And I think that's going to what the evolution, what we're seeing as well. And I think that's exciting for me because I think people thought as blockchain as a standalone technology, it's not, um, that's yeah. clear. Just wanted to share that. <laughs> okay. Actually, there are like uh, one one or two follow-up last questions. Maybe we, we can spend five more minutes. Yeah, yeah. please yeah. go ahead, Sukesh, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, there's a follow-up question from Patrick here, like uh, Intel have massive security issues with PUF SRAM problem. Are you also working on other solutions uh, in relation to that? Um, so, I don't know. I'm, I'm not familiar with this myself. So, so uh, good question. So you probably they they've been there's been some side attacks on Intel and Intel have put some patches and replacements very quickly. They've these are stuff that's been in the main and you probably see it on Reddit and stuff like that. Uh, Intel have been well advanced on releasing patches even for Microsoft Azure. Uh, we're part of the Confidential Computing Consortium. We're very up to date with what's happening with Intel. We're very close to them. They're an investor in R3. So you can expect that we're getting very, we're working very closely, that's all I can say. Um, and another thing to answer that question is um, we haven't looked into AMD uh, or other chipsets yet, but I know Google, for example, are working with AMD and they've made that publicly available. We will look into that in the future, possibly. Uh, but SGX is a focus area for us at the moment. Uh, there is one last point about the mass adoption, right? Like, or the trend that we are seeing right now. So Ricard uh, is asking here, why did it take so long to get here? Uh, as far as I can tell, we have these distributed ledger technologies back in the 90s as well. Uh, is it just the blockchain word uh, that's getting the traction for private blockchains or like uh, all these kind of solutions? Well, I think there's a few ways to approach that question, right? Part of it is that the, the emergence, the mass emergence of Bitcoin is really what then repopularized the idea of the technology behind it and how these things were going to be applied. I think we can attribute that. This was just a hypothesis, but, you know, that's really when, when we did start to see people questioning what was going on behind this massive, you know, this massive innovation in payments, which was cryptocurrencies, right? And Bitcoin um, being used in the public, in the general public and gaining prominence. Um, so that was one, one part of it. But I think on the other side is that, you know, especially in the last 20 years, the emergence of international business and the ecosystems have only become more and more complicated. Today, it's so you know, normal for it to know that our goods are made on the other side of the world and they've touched five or six different touch points just to get to us. And that's just talking about, you know, production. Never mind all of the, if there's capital markets involved, if there's any other sort of trade finance involved um, and just financing a project. So there's tons and tons of stakeholders and touch points of different people involved. And these are the types of solutions 
uh, sorry, these are the types of problems that require a solution like blockchain. So I think it kind of goes hand in hand um, as, you know, just understanding the world that we're doing business in today and needing these types of solutions where everybody can understand a center or everybody can have, you know, one truth in the real time at all times. Um, these are just <laughs> hypotheses, but food for thought. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably Brian, okay. do, you, do you want to add something? Yeah, probably one of the things I'll say interestingly, uh, and it's another technology, cloud computing. So I was at Society General in 2012, and I remember our CIO saying, we're never going to put anything in the cloud. And this was like in 2012, it was like, oh, the likes of AWS and um, Microsoft Azure were kind of pushing cloud computing. And it was like red tape from a regulate, not regulation, but from within the bank. It was like, why do we need the cloud? Um, and I think people ask you, why do we need a blockchain at this stage? And, and, and this is a blockchain is a lot more complicated than a cloud computing, running your microservices and moving and migrating stuff. It's multiple participants that really gives you the network effect. Right. So, uh, this is just gives you an indication. And now look at every single bank. I talk to these banks, um, now, and they're like, we want to deploy blockchain on the cloud. All right, great. Um, so they're moving their tier two and tier one applications onto the bank, uh, into, onto the cloud. So this is it takes a while for them to get this and they made investments, right? You've got to remember these guys made VMware virtual machine investments and mm. running their own servers. And it's, it's a game, right? You have to stay in the game and, and the value is there. As long as you believe in the value and you believe in the effect it will have, stick at it and it will come. And I think time will churn. You, you had the same with Linux and Linux um, for, you know, the, the mainframes. Yeah. Um, and then each technology goes for a cycle. And I think it's really important that you remember that this, if you remember what the cycle is and you go through uh, the trough of the solution, which we're, I think we're in now, but really coming out of it as the really business value is coming out the back of it. So I think just technology takes time, adoption takes time and people take time to adopt these technologies. And I think we're really seeing that now, the word blockchain, I, I prefer it like in the future, I, I think people will be saying, you never hear anyone say, I'm going to use the internet. They say, I'm going to use the application Google. I'm going to Google something, right? People won't even realize they're using this and it's running on a blockchain ledger. Um, and I think that's really important heading into the future. Okay, I think uh, with that said, I think uh, we can conclude to, uh, today's fireside chat. Uh, I think we had a really good discussion with lo lots of questions. And Magnus has a link to you, Brian, uh, about uh, yeah some Royal Ethereum and their solution, I guess, from EY. So you yep. should definitely check it out, I guess. Yep. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think uh, that's it. Thank you very much uh, for your participation today, both Emma and Brian. Uh, we, re we really appreciate that. And, and thanks to all the audience as well. Like uh, it was really good uh, that they had many questions today and uh, it was an engaging discussion. Uh, yeah, yeah no, it. I want to say thank you as well. Yes, please. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Emma. That was really great. Even for someone that is not a tech person like me, it <laughs> was very, very uh, in reaching, I learned a lot about pr private blockchains and thank you guys. It was like, you know, lots of things happening in the chat room, lots of questions, discussions as well, which is always good. So this is our last meetup of 2020. We're coming back next year. Maybe we do a, something about eCorona, who knows, or maybe <laughs> something else. Uh, we have a list of uh, subjects we asked uh, and some suggestions for the next meetup. So watch your space, watch, uh, follow LinkedIn page, just go to LinkedIn, Swedish Blockchain Association. You can find me, I'm the only one on LinkedIn and the Paul Vikas, you can find Sukesh. And yeah, and if you guys have any questions, uh, I can pass them to Brian or Emma. My email address is on the chat. So that's it, guys. Thank you. Yeah, Have Pete. a nice uh, end of 2020. Yes. Take care. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Bye. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. Thanks a lot.